Quantum Break is an interesting project, filled with flaws and incredibly bright spots. It's somehow both great, interesting, unique, and frustrating, clunky, and odd at the same time. This duality, both ends of the same extreme, exists in Quantum Break's form of media as well. Remedy once again decided to blur the lines between video game and the rest of the media space. Quantum Break is somehow both a video game and a television show at once, or at least that's how it markets itself. It's not really a television show, it's just a video game with long cutscenes that use FMV instead of full renders. It's what the game decides to do with those cutscenes that make it interesting. Quantum Break's flaws lie in its combat, some of its performances, and some of these FMVs. But its high points lie in its interesting narrative, its choice-based mechanics, and its kitschy nature. I think the world and structure of the story are what make it genuinely interesting. Changing cutscenes and stories based on the collectibles that you find and the choices you made is a bold idea to try and implement. Not only that, but the entire focus of the narrative being based around how its time travel system works is great as well. The question that the audience is asking is, how does this power function? That isn't answered up front, but is the focus of the story, and that's a genuinely interesting way to approach time travel. Like I said though, the game does have its flaws, some incredibly inconsistent combat and some general awkward moments overall. This was the first time I ever played Quantum Break. It was the last Remedy game that I hadn't played before going down the list of their projects. I had purposefully avoided it because most people said it just wasn't worth your time. It's a shame though, because even though the game is certainly no 10 out of 10, I definitely wish I would have experienced it sooner. It's really worthy of a look because it does explore some interesting concepts and it's a neat little universe and experiment in gaming. The game isn't the greatest thing ever made, but it is incredibly ambitious, like most Remedy properties are. It's trying to do something new, and for that it deserves to be commended, but that doesn't make it immune to the ire of criticism. And criticize we will, as we take a deep dive into Quantum Break. Today I'll be talking about gameplay, story, mechanics, and everything in between. If you haven't seen my last video on Alan Wake, it is tangentially connected to this game, and I would recommend checking it out because it will be slightly relevant. If you enjoy the video, make sure to leave a like and subscribe to the channel so that you can see the continuation of this series. You can also support me over on Patreon where I upload longer versions of my full series retrospectives and scattered text post updates. You can also follow me on Twitch, where I play games that I'm not currently reviewing. Spoilers ahead for Quantum Break. Hey dad, it's me, your favorite son, and today I'd like to talk about Quantum Break. Quantum Break was developed by Remedy Entertainment. Remedy was originally trying to pitch Microsoft Studios a sequel to Alan Wake that included some live action elements. Microsoft was not interested in publishing a sequel to Alan Wake though, since the game had done kind of poorly in sales. They were interested in the live action aspect of that idea though, so they wanted Remedy to move forward with that on a new IP. The team at Remedy wanted to make a game about time travel, with the idea actually originating from the Night Springs episode about quantum ooey-eyed in Alan Wake. With the new IP ideas in place, Remedy pitched the idea again to Microsoft and they agreed to let Remedy move forward with the project. The game officially began pre-production in 2011. The story was written by Sam Lake and a team of three writers, Miko Rautalati, Tyler Burton Smith, and Cameron Rogers all worked on the game's writing, while only Smith is credited with writing the TV show. Rogers was an author that was shortlisted to work with Remedy on this new IP because of his previous work, The Music of Razors. The team took heavy inspiration from pop culture with this entry. This was as per usual, but it seems like the inspirations this time around were a little bit more mainstream. Films like Inception and Interstellar, The Matrix, Back to the Future, Primer, and Looper were all the biggest influences on the story. 
The whole goal with Quantum Break's story was to make it unpredictable, and to make it play off of the cliches of things that had come before it. Remedy was hoping to learn this time around, though, trying to develop the new entry in their history, the Ultimate Remedy game, as they called it. The game was described as a transmedia action shooter, video game and television hybrid. This really just means that it was an action-adventure game with a TV show combined into the product. Sam Lake originally wanted the game and the TV show to be completely different things, featuring wildly different characters, but the team scrapped this idea. It made more sense to have the two blend together a little better. One of the large goals with the story was that each player have an individual experience. This is reflected in the collectibles that are in the game. Certain collectibles will affect the TV show and cause a ripple effect, adding or removing scenes based on whether you found them or not. The TV show portions of the game were actually shot by a company called Lifeboat Productions. The team wanted the science in the game to be realistic, so they consulted a scientist, a lecturer at Helsinki University. This helped them ensure that the game's story and world conformed to the current physics of the time. The game was also a massive upgrade for the team in terms of tech. The Northlight engine was created between Alan Wake and Quantum Break. It's still the engine that Remedy is currently using and was a massive breakthrough for them as a studio. After years of work, Quantum Break was announced on May 21st, 2013. The game was shown off at E3 and in Gamescom in 2014. It was originally set for release in 2015, but the game was held off for a year so as not to compete with Halo 5, Rise of the Tomb Raider, and Forza Motorsport 6. Quantum Break was finally released on April 5th, 2016 for Xbox One and Microsoft Windows. Before we get into things, I want to briefly talk about the structure of this video. Because Quantum Break is a story about time travel, I will be approaching this series in a slightly different manner. We will first talk about the game and its TV show companion, going over the story and the gameplay as it's presented in the experience. Then I will go back and revisit the timeline of the game in chronological order, going over the main events. I've chosen this approach mostly because once we revisit these things, the story will begin to make a little more sense. We can also get a full picture of what exactly happens in Quantum Break. Quantum Break begins with a narration, giving us a general overview of the story and a tease of what's to come. In general, our story is about Jack, a guy with powers, fighting another guy with powers. Time is about to end and our heroes are trying to stop it. This is just the beginning of things, but I have literally no idea why the game feels the need to give us this trailer at the beginning of the game. The framing device for this story is that Jack is telling the events to a woman that is interviewing him, but it really starts back at Riverport University on October 9th, 2016. We get a little clue that something is going to happen when the game tells us that this date is 15 minutes to a fracture in time. Jack is here to see someone named Paul Serene, a very old friend of his from childhood. Paul emailed Jack and said that he had something urgent to show him. He needed him at the school right away. Exploring around the school, we can quickly find the remnants of a protest on campus. There's a company called Monarch that is trying to interfere with the school's library, and some of the students aren't too happy about it. Here, we can actually find a TV that's playing a trailer for a new show, one starring Alan Wake himself and Sam Lake as a detective looking for him, Alex Casey. This show is aptly titled Return, the manuscript that Alan Wake was writing at the end of his story. Jack meets up with Paul who leads him through the building to take him to whatever he needs to show him. There's some optional information that we can find around this area to give us some context to the situation. Jack's brother, William Joyce, was brought in to consult on Paul's new project, but apparently William had caused some issues. Will was brought on because another scientist working on the project, Dr. Kim, had died. We can convince Paul to give us a brief presentation on Project Promenade, his new focus. This project was focused on conquering time, literally inventing time travel. We eventually find out that Paul's project has actually built a functioning time machine. Paul wants Jack to activate the machine while he goes inside to prove his brother wrong. Apparently, William had gotten the financial backers to leave the project, believing there to be devastating miscalculations with the design of the machine. 
Paul decides to use the machine, and just as he does, another version of himself comes out, having already traveled back in time to this point. Paul then steps in the machine two minutes later to travel back in time himself and see another version of Jack and himself. Just then, William arrives trying to shut the machine down, but Jack refuses. The core then malfunctions and creates a massive explosion. Jack is knocked out, and when he wakes up, he sees that the world is frozen in time. Jack manages to free William, who is still frozen, and the two escape, while Paul must use the machine to get out. Jack begins to escape with William, who explains that the explosion has just caused time to be fractured. Luckily, he's created a countermeasure to fix the fracture and avoid the inevitable end of time entirely. We eventually start to shoot at the agents chasing us, and we get a crash course on combat. Now, before we get too much further into the story, we should probably talk about combat in general. Quantum Break is an interesting game because it represents, in my eyes, the beginning of a new era for Remedy. Quantum Break certainly exhibits a lot of gameplay elements and design that we should see from Remedy in the future, but it really doesn't have that polish and shine yet. It is, at its core, a third-person action-adventure game. We can get access to a variety of different weapons, pistols, shotguns, assault rifles, but can hold only three at once. Ammunition is never in short supply. Taking out enemies will leave piles of ammunition and weapons on the ground for us to waltz over and pick up, so we never really have to worry about guns in general. The main center of Quantum Break's combat system lies in the powers that Jack has access to. These time travel powers are what make up the rest of the combat system. These powers begin pretty small, with us having access to time vision, a power that will let us see a red highlighted enemies and orange environmental objects that can be used to blow our adversaries up. We eventually get six total powers, though. Time stop allows us to fire a projectile and stop time at the area that it lands on. We can also shoot into that area and stack bullets. Once time is resumed, the bullets fly into the target, dealing a massive amount of damage. Time shield allows us to slow time around ourselves in a small area and create a shield, both stopping oncoming damage and healing us briefly. Time blast allows us to explode an area, delivering a powerful burst of damage. Time dodge gives us the ability to dash out of the way and aim down sights to slow down time for a brief moment and fire off some shots. Time rush is similar to time dodge, except we can run around and melee people as well, taking them out up close and personal. All of these powers come together to form the core of Quantum Break's combat. We can also upgrade each power with chronon particles that are found by exploring different areas throughout the game. I will say that the combat in Quantum Break can get pretty intense, with all of these powers in mind, each having a cooldown timer of its own, trying to run around, dodge, use your shield, blast enemies, and freeze foes can be a lot in the middle of battle. It can feel pretty good though when you pull off a good sequence of dodges and attacks. Running around an enemy, blasting them with a shotgun to the back of the head to only immediately freeze the one beside them and start blasting again is great when you can pull it off well. But Quantum Break has a real issue with a combat system that doesn't start to rear its head until closer to the second half of the game. The consistency in which this combat works and how it works is incredibly uneven. Sometimes we'll be able to pull these moves off with ease, and other times the game will throw so many enemies at us that we won't know what to do. It's incredibly inconsistent, and there are some sequences in the game that are so frustrating just because there's 30 enemies in front of us and not really much we can do. We also have such little health that if we make one unlucky move, it's kind of over for us. This also isn't to mention the fact that most of our powers are close combat related, meaning it's more advantageous to use if we're real close to enemies, but the game seems to want us to play from afar. This is difficult when there's really only one long-ranged weapon in the game that's even halfway effective, and it's not very common. I think there are some really interesting ideas here. I like the idea of freezing time and running around the battlefield to get a second to breathe. I also think that the game's power system feels like a good implementation of super speed in a video game, even though that's not what the story is at all. But there are just way too many kinks in this game that need ironed out. 
Again, I do think that Remedy has a good idea, but they were working something out in this entry. They definitely would have solidified it much better in their next game, but for now, we're left with Quantum Break. Jack and Will try to head back to William's car so they can retrieve the countermeasure, but William is kidnapped by Monarch. Monarch is the company that's behind the library demolition. Jack meets Beth Wilder, who tells him where his brother is at. Once we rescue Will, we are quickly stopped by Paul, but a different Paul, dressed differently and much older. It's clear that he's not exactly the same Paul that was trying to help us before. He blows up the library and William is trapped inside. Jack watching William die is the catalyst for his character. It's his inciting incident, the beginning of his hero's journey. It's the reason that he goes on, and it also at once creates a Paul Serene antagonist for us. Jack is taken captive by Monarch, and we get our first Junction. Junctions are short sections where we get to control Paul, the villain of the story, for a brief period of time. In this period, we get to make a major choice, one that will have a large effect on the story moving forward. This is a genuinely interesting choice for the design of Quantum Break, mostly because putting choices at the forefront is already rare, but making our choices happen in the shoes of the game's antagonist is even rarer. It's a bold move and one that actually makes us sit back and think about what's going to happen. I also think the choices were something that I genuinely had to stop and think about. There are only four of these junctions throughout the course of the game, but they never seemed really black and white to me. There was always something to determine, something to be decided. I had to genuinely stop and think about what I was going to do. The proof in this also comes in the form of seeing the stats after we make these choices. The game will usually tell us how our choice is aligned with others, and I was surprised to see a decently close split on a lot of these. At our first junction, Paul and his right-hand man, Martin Hatch, decide what to do about the witnesses who saw their operation at the school. The main witness representing the movement is the protester girl that we talked to before. We can choose either Hardline or PR here. Hardline will see Paul's team getting rid of all the witnesses, killing them. PR will see them using the protesters to frame Jack Joyce, our main character, as a terrorist. For this junction, on my first playthrough, I chose PR. I really didn't want to massacre some protesters, and I figured this would probably be better for Jack overall. With this junction, Act 1 is over. There are five total acts in the game, and each one is usually split by an episode of the Quantum Break TV show. Now, this is the main draw of Quantum Break as a game, is that it isn't just a game, it's also a show. Actually, it's not also a show, it's something in between, some weird meshing of these two things at once, some meld of video game and TV that I haven't really seen before. Some of the interviews for the game said that the TV show wasn't 100% necessary, that you could skip it in the game if you wanted, but it was also highly recommended that you watch it. I would recommend it, not just because of the narrative information that it provides, but also for the experience as well. I find the whole marketing and explanation of Quantum Break as a TV show slash game to be quite odd, considering the fact that if they weren't filmed with real actors, then they'd just be real long cutscenes. We've seen longer cutscenes in things like Metal Gear Solid, Death Stranding, and Star Ocean. Quantum Break's TV show will cut in after each act, with four episodes in total. Each episode features actors playing the same characters that they did in-game. The graphical fidelity of Quantum Break as a game is just advanced enough that it's not incredibly jarring. The interesting thing about the show, though, is that it acts as almost a separate story. Sure, there are themes and characters that overlap with the game, but the few characters that do appear in the show don't really show up in the game for the most part. Now, of course, there are a few characters and moments in Quantum Break that will make literally no sense to you if you haven't seen the show, and one moment entirely that won't nearly hit as hard, but it's still worth noting that the show is almost a different narrative. It's also worth noting that the show will differ based on the choices that you make in the game. The junction choices will affect which timeline the episodes of your show are on, but Quantum Ripples will affect things as well. There are a handful of different items that we can find throughout the game, small collectibles that will affect the TV show specifically. For example, letting William solve this formula on the whiteboard at the beginning of the game will cause some randos in the show to say this. I was over in the lab at the university this morning. Someone solved the equation. Huh? I've just received yeah. word that Monarch Security... 
I do think the show is an interesting touch, and it's a really ambitious move. I think Remedy's style of blending media together is really wonderful. It's a wild new direction to go in with video games, and I think that Remedy would go on to perfect this idea entirely. As of Quantum Break, it isn't totally there, though. The TV show in particular seems to be of a different quality to the writing of the game. The TV show has very much a CW quality to it. If you've ever seen any of the Arrowverse programming or Supernatural or something like that, then you'll know what I mean. It's shot the same way. Maybe it's the camera they're using or the budget that they're on, but it just gives me those amateur cable sort of vibes. I also think that some of the actors don't do their best in this show. There's a few in particular that are just overdoing it so hard. This is in part due to the script and its info dumping random slews of information whenever it feels like it. There's a lot of flaws here, but that's why we're talking about it in the first place. Also, just for reference, I won't be going through every difference between each choice for the show, just because that would make this video an unreasonable length. I also think that leaving something to be discovered for the people that want to go play the game is probably the better option. I will only be talking about the version of the story with the choices that I made. The first episode begins with Martin Hatch interrogating Amy Ferrero, the protester that we met in the game. Hatch blackmails her into giving Monarch a statement for their PR campaign, using her family as collateral. Out in the hallway, Hatch uses some eye drops and then talks to Liam Burke, a higher-up handyman in the company. Apparently, Jack Joyce's transport has gone missing. Liam is to go home to his wife and wait for their next instruction. We're then introduced to another character, Charlie Wincott. Charlie works for Monarch as the head of digital security. He's getting ready to send that PR statement to the local news station. Hatch calls and tells Charlie to get the location of Jack's transport and forward it to Liam Burke. He also hints that there may be a traitor working within Monarch. Liam has arrived back at home and has a brief moment with his wife, who we learn is pregnant. She's clearly upset that he works so much and it also becomes clear that she doesn't know exactly what Liam does for work. Liam is again quickly called into work, though, when Charlie tells him that he's found Jack. Liam heads out to look for him, but there's a stutter in the world causing time to stop and freeze him and everything around him. Jack is not frozen and notices this shift as it reverts and the world starts going. Hatch talks to Paul, who says he had a vision of Jack at the island. Hatch also harps on Paul for not taking his treatments, something we aren't clear on yet. We're back at Monarch in the cafeteria and can see Amy on the news giving her statement. If we found the quantum ripple in the first act, we can hear two men talking about how someone solved the equation on the board. Fiona Miller takes some sandwiches from the cafeteria to Charlie, and it's clear that Charlie has feelings for her. He is smitten when she asks him to go to the Monarch party with her that night, but he's still confused as to the dynamic of their relationship because she calls him Buddy. We see the warehouse where Jack is being held. Beth Wilder was the one that kidnapped him. Liam quickly finds them and pulls a gun on Beth. They're in a standoff, but moments later, their guns are gone, and so is Jack. Beth thinks that time is coming to an end and that Monarch has been prepping for this for a long time. Jack could be the key to fixing everything. She starts to talk about something called the lifeboat protocol, but Monarch rushes in. Liam finally decides to help Beth out and fights against the soldiers. Beth tells Liam that she needs access to Dr. Kim's lab because he is somehow connected to this lifeboat. Charlie, of course, sees Liam fighting off the Monarch soldiers and takes the footage. Liam tries to approach Charlie to get him into Dr. Kim's lab, but Charlie tells him that he saw him on the camera. Charlie tells Liam to get out before he alerts everyone, and then as Liam runs away, Charlie does just that. Liam has to make a great escape out of the building, and we have an incredibly tense chase sequence, as Monarch aren't going to let him get away that easily. Eventually, Liam gets caught in an alley by way too many soldiers to fight off, and he gives himself up as the episode ends. Now, this episode is alright, and it's actually probably one of the best out of the four. It's paced pretty well, it develops the characters decently. One big complaint I have with the whole show is that the action sequences are shot pretty poorly. It's half a problem with shooting and half a problem with editing. There are way too many cuts, way too fast in a lot of these sequences. The editing is really a problem with the entire show. Cuts that happen so fast we almost don't know what's going on. It can be kind of hard to watch at certain points, but when you're trying to cover up bad choreography, holding a shot too long is kind of the enemy. 
I will say that some of the acting in the show can be good, but it's mostly from the people that are like actual actors. Lance Reddick, RIP Big Dog, has given amazing performances in things like the John Wick series and The Wire. Sure, he's been in his fair share of schlock, but he knows what he's doing. Aiden Gillen was Littlefinger in Game of Thrones and said, you're a big guy in The Dark Knight Rises. Sean Ashmore is a little bit of a mixed bag because sure, he was in the dope ass original X-Men movies as Iceman Bobby Drake, but he was also in terrible movies like Frozen and The Ruins. Patrick Husinger's performance as Liam Burke is particularly wooden. He's mostly been in junk I've never heard of, though he did play a very minor character in Noah Baumbach's Francis Ha, but again, it was so minor you wouldn't even remember it. I also find Marshall Allman as Charlie to be particularly grating in the show, though that is kind of the point of his character. Mimi Michaels, who plays Fiona, was in the fucking Gamer movie, which is just one of the worst things I've ever seen. And Brooke Nevin plays Emily Burke, and her most known role was in The Comebacks, a terrible sports parody movie led by David Kochner and directed by Tom Brady, not that Tom Brady. The acting is just particularly poor across the show when it comes to people you don't really recognize. This could be due to poor direction in general, as I'm sure you could squeeze some good performances out of these people if you really, really knew what you were doing. We then jump back into the game, Act 2 of our story. We get to see how Jack escaped captivity. A stutter happened, causing time to freeze, and he took Beth and Liam's guns. There are some puzzles in Quantum Break, some very simple obstacles that we'll have to surpass to move forward. These are generally pretty rudimentary, though. They're not complicated in any way and really don't provide much challenge or require much critical thought. I think that there was a lot more that could be done with the time powers relating specifically to puzzles, but I don't think that Quantum Break does much in this regard. Jack makes his way through these industrial buildings and eventually saves Amy Ferrero. If we would have picked the hardline option before, then he would see Nick Masters instead. The interesting thing about Nick Masters is that his likeness was originally the main character of Quantum Break in a prototype that was shown off but was then changed when Sean Ashmore was selected. We eventually begin to encounter striker units. These complicate combat a little bit. These are monarch soldiers that have chronon harnesses attached to their backs. They aren't stopped by the time stutter and therefore aren't affected by a lot of our powers. We can still focus downtime to aim at them after using certain abilities, but a lot of our time altering mechanics won't affect them. We eventually head into ground zero, Time here is fully broken, more than we've seen before. We track down Paul, who is escaping on a helicopter. He tries to stop us by crashing a massive ship into Jack. We have to weave through the ship here as time fluctuates around it, starting and stopping, stuttering. We finally meet up with Beth again, who makes it clear that she's here to help us. We head for the Bradbury Swimming Hall, where William used to keep his office. Beth tells us that she's been preparing for the fracture for most of her life. Here, we realize that William had bought this building and kept it secret. He was working on a time machine here for years and eventually built a working one. The countermeasure that we're looking for, though, is gone, and an old video of William says that Beth was the one that took it, but she doesn't remember this. We try to use the time machine, but it's broken and malfunctioning. I have to say that the designs for the time machines in Quantum Break are actually wildly interesting. The fact that the machine has a moving corridor surrounding a black hole is just nuts. Seeing it in motion makes it all seem pretty grandiose. We can also find out through some optional documents that the time machine functions like a clock. When you walk inside, walking clockwise will take you into the future and counterclockwise will take you into the past. There's a lot of information that we find out through optional documents, actually. There's so much history, understanding of timelines, and just general events that we have no knowledge of if we don't seek out and read these materials, papers, and little pieces of information. Some of the collectibles are also called intel. Getting a certain amount of intel will actually unlock different diaries in the menus from different characters that we can listen to. These span many different times and provide insight into these people, their motivations, and overall plot details. This is Remedy to a T, though. This is what they're known for, not just telling a story through cutscenes and background dialogue, but through notes, emails, pieces of media, anything and everything they can use. 
This can, of course, make the search for this information all the more fun. It feels like putting together a puzzle. This is nowhere better served than in a time travel story, where we need to piece together the timeline to even figure out what happened. Jack then decides to head to Gull Island and find Dr. Amaral, a higher up at Monarch Solutions, to try and get more information. Jack is immediately captured by the soldiers and gives himself up. This is where we get our second junction. Here we can choose to let Hatch interrogate Jack or have Paul interrogate him personally. This is such an odd decision, one of the ones that I had the hardest time with. There's a strange dichotomy with these decisions because we're playing the antagonist. We're not really sure how to choose. On one hand, we're playing a character, so we automatically feel like we should side with that character. There's an inherent justification for their actions as soon as we begin controlling them, even if it's only for a few moments. But suddenly we remember that we're playing the antagonist and we have to focus our choices around that to try and sabotage the antagonist in any way that we can. This ends up in a strange loop where we don't know what or how to make the correct choice. It's a wild position to be put in, and something that I haven't really seen a lot of choice-based mechanic games do. Here, I chose to let Paul interrogate Jack. This was mostly because I wanted to see what the two did together, and this big confrontation felt like it should happen naturally in the story. The downside of this was that Monarch would begin crumbling because Paul wasn't there to make his speech at the gala tonight. Here, we end the second act of the game and begin the second episode of the TV show. The episode opens with Paul getting one of his treatments from Dr. Amaral. She's very concerned with his condition and thinks that it will only get worse. At the mansion, a gala is being held and Charlie and Fiona are in attendance. Charlie starts to tell Fiona about the traitor that he caught today but holds back the identity of the person because he isn't supposed to reveal that type of information. Clearly Fiona is up to something though. Jack is tossed into the back of a van, one that's already holding Liam Burke captive. We get a short scene between Amaral and Hatch as we realize that their motives are not the same. They clearly don't see eye to eye on Paul's condition and Hatch seems to not care much at all. Hatch calls someone and tells them to make the presentation look good. Charlie and Fiona are at the gala getting tipsy. Fiona invites Charlie to go for a walk, the latter clearly thinking that he's finally made it. Liam escapes his cell by convincing a guard to let him go to the bathroom. Charlie and Fiona walk in the woods and a quantum ripple of a local sports team will appear if we found it. Liam confronts Charlie in the woods and he quickly realizes that Fiona is connected to Beth Wilder. The group of three make their way into a research lab and find some sort of shifting specimen being held on lockdown. This specimen is then revealed to be Dr. Kim, who is definitely not dead. Paul finally begins to confront Jack. He tells him that he cannot change the past. It's not possible, and he's tried. The two saw a dead body when they were young, and Paul went back to try and convince the man to not jump from a roof, but scared him and caused the man to jump in the first place. Paul tries to justify Will's death, and this angers Jack. Paul wants Jack to tell him where the other time machine is, but he refuses. We then jump back to the group at the lab. Charlie finds a document about the countermeasure written by Dr. Amaral. We find out that the stutters are increasing and this will inevitably lead to the end of time. The lab is stormed by monarch soldiers. The group tries to run away, but Fiona is trapped in a stutter. We realize that the inside of the lab is stutter-proof. They grab some chronon harnesses and Charlie puts his on, but before Liam can put his on, Charlie takes it and runs away. Liam then has to wait for the stutter to end before he and Fiona can make their escape. We then jump back to the game to begin Act 3. Jack is freed from his captivity by Beth Wilder. He then begins to search the island for Dr. Amaral. We're introduced to the juggernaut enemies who are big massive foes that can only be damaged at a small point on their back. We also find Chronon Dampeners, which when we're in their vicinity will not allow us to use our powers. We eventually get a harness for Beth to wear so that she can be free of the stutters. When we arrive at the gala, Beth is already in a stutter and we have to get her out. This whole area is pretty great. Seeing a party frozen in time like this is just a massively wonderful set piece. There are a lot of environments like this, and I think that the game should have focused on these sequences being frozen in time more, because there's a lot of beautiful environments that can be created with it. We eventually get Dr. Amaral free and save her from being assassinated by a drone that Hatch had sent. We realize that Hatch is actually working against Paul. He's the traitor and is trying to take control of Monarch for himself. We free the doctor and she escapes the island with Beth while Jack steals one of Paul's sports cars. Paul is furious when he realizes that Amaral is gone and wants to know who the traitor in his midst is. 
Here, we can choose to either trust Amaral or Hatch. I chose to trust Amaral, mostly because Hatch was already proven to be a traitor. We really had no evidence of Amaral doing anything against Paul. But this is one of those moments again where we aren't sure what decision to make. If we know that Hatch is the traitor, shouldn't we pick the other option to screw Paul over in the end? It's another interesting choice. Paul eventually realizes that Beth is the one that has been the mole in his organization. He's seen her before. When he first used the time machine, she tried to kill him, but he never realized who she was. This marks the end of Act 3 and the beginning of Episode 3 of the show. Charlie arrives back at the mansion, a harness hidden under his clothes. We once again see Hatch putting eye drops into his eyes. He begins to question Charlie and tells him about the lifeboat protocol. It hasn't really been clear up to this point what the lifeboat protocol is, especially if we haven't been paying attention to documents along the way. The lifeboat protocol is a program that was made to save essential monarch personnel when the end of time arrives. The end of time is the entire reason that Monarch was created. Paul knew that the end of time was coming and was trying to prepare for it. He did this by creating the lifeboat, a massive housing of people with stutterproof technology inside, allowing tons of scientists to have much more time to complete the research necessary to fix time once again. The lifeboat protocol is only for essentials though, and the people that won't be on the lifeboat don't even know about it. Liam Burke, for example, was designated not essential, mostly because of his attachment to his wife and child. Hatch tells Charlie that he can make him essential if he decides to defect and work for him instead of Paul Serene. Charlie tells Hatch he needs to go back to the HQ so he can be his man on the inside. Paul is then informed that time is breaking down faster than they thought before, that time will collapse in eight hours rather than the lengthy amount of time that they thought they had. Liam and Fiona catch back up with Charlie, who tells them about the lifeboat. The three of them then head under Gull Island. Hatch then decides to free Dr. Kim by blowing up the lab that he's in. There's a very weird moment where time stutters and Charlie is able to move because of his harness. There's definitely some nefarious shit going on in his eyes, but he doesn't get time to do anything before time starts again. The three are then cut off by a man named Carlo, who works for Monarch. He shoots Liam and Charlie convinces him to let the other two go. Fiona punches Charlie and leaves him. Charlie tries to get some sympathy because he was led on or whatever, but that doesn't mean he still isn't an asshole. Turns out Liam wasn't dead and he gets up to kill Carlo. Hatch tries to blame the lab explosion on Amaral, but Paul doesn't believe him. Serene's only remaining treatments were in that lab as well. Paul has something called Cronon Syndrome, a disease that not much is known about. It's deteriorating him and his mind, causing him to become more aggressive and more detached from time and space. These treatments could have extended his life, but now that there's none left, he's in serious danger. Paul finally decides to use the CFR, a monarch device, and activate the lifeboat protocol, much to Hatch's dismay. Liam heads to the hospital where his wife works and sees her talking to Gibson, a monarch employee. Liam is attacked and takes out the man in the middle of the hospital. His wife is, of course, afraid of him after seeing him kill a man, and he tries to explain everything to her. She finally agrees to go with Liam to Monarch as he tries to get them into the lifeboat. The episode ends, at least in my timeline, with Paul telling a soldier that he wants Hatch to be taken in. Act 4 begins as Jack is stopped near a bridge that Monarch has blocked off. Weaving through the buildings, we can find an episode of Night Springs where the team has lost their narrator and has to try and audition for a new one. Uh, we can't find him, so we need to look into a, you know, a, uh, a replacement. Jack is eventually discovered by Monarch and caught in a shipwreck on the bridge. Here we have to jump through massive stutters of time while pieces of debris fly and crash into things. This section was kind of frustrating for me. Maybe I just never got the hang of the platforming, but it always felt like it was kind of wonky. Timing is absolute key, but I felt I had to do a few jumps over and over just to get it right. Beth and Jack are reunited, and the two need Amaral to fix William's time machine so that they can fix time in general. She doesn't think that time can be fixed based on Paul's experiences. She thinks time is a closed loop. I will say that this is one of the most interesting things that Quantum Break does as a story, not just through the cutscenes and show, but also through documents. We'll find many different things telling us how time works in this universe. Both Paul and William seem to think that time is a closed loop. This means that you could go back in time to try and fix something, but you'll probably just end up causing that very thing to happen in the first place. Many films take this sort of approach, 12 Monkeys, Looper, Interstellar, there are a ton of examples of this happening, but the thing that Quantum Break does different is it makes you question if this is true. 
Usually the closed loop exists as a narrative twist. We find this out near the end of our tale, but here we already know this in the beginning. There are subtle hints throughout the game that make us question whether time can really be changed or not. I like this because we question the entire basis for the structure of time throughout the story rather than motivations. It's a great setup and has us constantly wondering if we actually know what's going on. Amaral helps get the machine working while Jack and Beth find a mural of Beth as a child painted by someone named Toto. We've seen a lot of these murals throughout the game depicting different events. This convinces Beth that she met an older version of herself when she was young and confirms for her that time cannot be changed. Jack is convinced he can change things in the past, so he decides to head back to 2010. Beth goes into the machine, but Dr. Amaral betrayed them, setting the date for the end of time. The other thing about time travel in this universe is that you cannot travel back to before the core of the time machine was first activated. This was the furthest date back that William's time machine could go. Paul sets the machine properly and heads to 2010. He finds Beth there, having lived the last 11 years normally. She's clearly traumatized, seen way too many things that she doesn't want to talk about. We can read her journal and see everything that she went through. There is an odd focus in this game with people trying to stop 9-11. Both Paul and Beth tried to stop it multiple times, but it never worked. I get what they're doing here, and in that modern time span, that date would have held the biggest tragedy, but it's still sort of odd the focus that's put on it. Beth was actually sent to the end of time. She saw Paul there, and the two chased each other, both trying to take down the other person. There they found that the end of time was inhabited by shifters, some strange beings that call that place their home. They don't adhere to the rules of time, and clearly this is what Paul has been fighting against. He wants to stop the end of time and the shifters from taking over, or at least save as many people as he can. Beth was traumatized by seeing what happens to the world. Beth then follows Paul back to 1999 and stopped him from killing William. She then lived the next 11 years out normally because she realized that time couldn't be changed. Beth was the reason that William built the machine called the countermeasure in the first place to try and fix the fracture in time. The two head to William's workshop and steal the countermeasure, the same thing that we saw William say happened on the video earlier. Paul is already there to stop them though. Beth refuses to work with Paul and she is shot, the countermeasure flying from her hands. When the countermeasure activates, it causes Ground Zero, an event that has been talked about for the entire game. This sends Jack back to 2016 and he sees an echo of time. He watches as Beth is killed, unable to do anything to stop it because it already happened six years ago. I think this scene is actually really well done. Having Jack forced to watch as Beth is killed is another huge motivator for him moving forward. Also, we as the audience realize the futility of what is happening. He's trying to stop it, but he can't do anything about it. It's pretty sad and very bleak. Jack leaves and is determined to take back the countermeasure from Paul. We get our last junction in the game. We play as Paul once again, as his condition is rapidly deteriorating. He only has one treatment left, one that was recovered from the lab explosion. He has no idea if it will even work or if it's safe to use. Paul is also becoming much more paranoid, clearly mistrusting everyone around him. We can choose to let Paul take the final treatment in the control choice to try and see the lifeboat plan through, or we can choose to let Paul surrender to the Cronon Syndrome and let his plan fail. I chose the control option. I felt it made a better villain to have Paul go all out and finally try and see things through. Paul surrendering before the very end just didn't seem to fit his character very well. This ends Act 4 and begins the final episode of the Quantum Break show. We see Martin Hatch being apprehended by Monarch security. He is taken into an elevator and steps out having killed the soldiers inside. We realize now that Hatch also has Cronon-related powers, at some point having obtained them. I think Hatch's character is really interesting in this regard. Clearly, he's been working behind the scenes the entire time. He's been exerting his control from the shadows, but all along, he's been incredibly powerful. He could have taken back what he wanted by force, but he didn't. Because it wasn't the smartest thing to do, he held back, and he only used his powers as a last-ditch effort. This fits his character very well and makes him seem all the more powerful for it, as he doesn't make his power known. This episode of the show is also the most variable, because your choices in previous junctions begin to pile up, having cascading effects. This episode could be different if you picked the Control and the Amaral option before, and it could be different if you picked Control and the Hatch option before. 
In my version of the episode, Amaral arrives back at Monarch, heading to see Paul. He sends her off to the lifeboat, telling her that he'll join her soon. Charlie hacks into the Monarch computers and adds himself and Fiona to the list for the lifeboat. Fiona is told by Jack that Beth died. She realizes she needs to help Jack get the countermeasure from Monarch, the thing that is powering the lifeboat protocol. Fiona then gets a message from Charlie telling her that he put her on the list. Charlie finally enters the lifeboat and no one is there. He's by himself for a bit and then people begin to fill in, Fiona herself arriving. I will say that I thought the lifeboat was going to be a little cooler. It does just kind of look like an underground bunker, which is nice, but it was just built up for so long that I wish its design was a little more creative. Fiona explains what needs to be done to Charlie, and in his final redeeming moment, he offers to get the countermeasure himself. I don't really think this redeems him, actually, because I feel like they made Charlie a little bit too much of a sniveling turd, but that's just me. Charlie begins working with Jack over the radio to try and guide him to the countermeasure. When Liam and Emily arrive, Paul explains that he needs Liam to protect the countermeasure. If it isn't protected, then there will be no lifeboat to go to. If he is successful, then his wife will be added to the list and will weather the end of time safely. Liam heads upstairs to try and get to the countermeasure. Charlie is already at the top of the tower, hacking into the countermeasure so that Jack can take it. Liam arrives, though, and tells Charlie to back off. Charlie is then shot by Hatch, who arrives, also trying to kill Liam. Before he can grab the machine, though, Liam attacks him and kills him. Liam then suits up in a striker outfit and awaits Jack's arrival, ending the TV show. We begin the fifth act of the game, and I have to say, this is where the combat encounters start to become pretty uneven. Here, I feel like the game just begins to throw huge amounts of enemies at us. It no longer becomes a challenge, just staying back and shooting. It's more of a waiting game than a fast-paced fight. It can be pretty laborious at times, and some of these fights just drag on. Jack finally arrives at Monarch HQ to find that time has begun to degrade fully at this point. Jack is attacked by one of the shifters that's been killing striker units. We eventually arrive at the countermeasure to find Liam guarding it. This is one of my favorite moments in the game, one that's been built up to the entire time. The whole game makes a point to try and blur the lines between friend and foe. We realize here that every striker that we've killed so far, every monarch soldier, was probably just following orders. Sure, some of them were probably just bad people, but these people thought they were doing the right thing. That extends to Paul as well. They were led to believe something, and the game tries to make us sympathize with them. We eventually have to kill Liam, Jack not really knowing who he is. We also find Charlie dead, and Jack grabs the countermeasure, traveling back in time to 2016. We realize that in the first level of the game, Monarch was dealing with someone else. That was Jack the whole time. Jack ends up saving William from the blast, but William never actually died. This always happened. Time must be a closed loop. William wants to return to the present and use the countermeasure to fix the fracture in time. Jack sees Beth during a stutter, still alive. He almost takes her out of the stutter, but stops. Jack and William head back in time and William is trapped in a stutter. Paul and his forces begin to attack and we have one final battle. We have to fight tons of Monarch security and attack Paul when he's vulnerable. Jack punches Paul who lands on his neck and dies. William and Jack use the countermeasure causing a massive explosion and fixing the fracture in time. They've completed their mission. It must be possible to change things because they just did. Paul's body is missing though and William believes that the fracture isn't done just yet. Jack starts to get visions of himself at the end of time and starts experiencing symptoms of Cronon Syndrome. We jump forward a month to the frame that the entire game has been following. Jack has been being interviewed by a woman at Monarch. The woman asks Jack if he believes that time is a closed loop now with everything he's seen. We then see him telling Beth that he'll come back for her. Jack talks to Hatch outside of the interview, who offers him a spot at Monarch. Jack then sees one final vision, one junction, to either join Monarch or leave them behind. But we don't get to make this decision, because the game ends here. Before we talk about my final thoughts on the game, I'd like to go back through and briefly explain some things. A lot of this probably doesn't make sense, even if you've played Quantum Break. This is mostly because Quantum Break has a pretty complicated timeline. I didn't think it was that complicated after I played the game until I started looking closer. So I'd like to go down the list of events to see exactly what happened along the way. The story really starts in 1997 when William Joyce began working on research into Cronon Energy. William worked with Elton Meyer on this discovery and began gaining media attention for it. In 98, 
William began some preliminary experiments with a hamster. In 99, William first activated the time machine in his workshop. Paul immediately emerged from the machine and tried to kill William, Beth arriving shortly after, preventing him from dying. Beth then informed William of what his time machine was going to do in the future and told him to build a countermeasure, a device that could fix the fracture in time that would inevitably happen. The Paul that traveled back to 99 is from 2016 and begins to start the bare bones of Monarch Solutions. Around this time, William buys the Bradbury swimming pool in an effort to make this his main place of work. William starts working on the countermeasure here and Beth goes into hiding. Beth also finds her eight-year-old self and gives her a notebook of events that will happen in the future, and also ways to prepare for what is coming. Anthony and Catherine Joyce, William and Jack's parents, are killed in a car accident, which Beth tries to prevent, to no avail. In the year 2000, Monarch begins tracking William, and Beth stops directly contacting him to avoid being found out. Monarch begins researching physics and buying out media companies to control public image. The Beth from 2016 begins training and preparing for 2010, also spray painting and putting graffiti around town under the name Toto after her favorite band. In 2001, Martin Hatch joins Monarch. In 2002, Beth is almost caught and killed by Monarch Solutions. It's around this time that she also begins having nightmares regarding her experience in the end of time. In 2006, Monarch buys out Gull Island and starts a research facility there. Martin Hatch is then given the position of head spokesperson at Monarch, and the previous spokesperson is found dead. In 2008, Beth reaches out to William and he explains the countermeasure to her. In 2009, Dr. Kim joins Monarch Solutions. The same year, Monarch also begins monitoring William's workshop. In 2010, Jack and William get into an argument and Jack decides to leave the country, starting a new life. At this time, William also begins to complete the countermeasure. On July 4th, William completes the countermeasure and Jack from 2016 arrives in 2010. He steals the countermeasure only to see Paul kill Beth and cause Ground Zero. Ground Zero is the massive event in which the countermeasure was set off, causing tons of chronon particles to be released. William tries to contact Beth multiple times, but she doesn't answer because she's dead. Sophia Amaral joins Monarch Solutions. Somewhere around 2010, the present-day Paul joins Riverport University and begins working on Project Promenade, the time machine that we see at the beginning of the game. At this time, Dr. Kim starts writing about the countermeasure and Monarch starts referring to it as the CFR or Chronon Field Regulator. In 2011, Monarch begins constructing the lifeboat. In 2015, Monarch begins using the CFR for the lifeboat system. In 2016, Dr. Kim has an accident which exposes him to massive amounts of Chronon energy. The event is covered up, and the official story is that he died. On October 9th of the same year, Jack arrives at Riverport University, and the fracture in time occurs. Paul travels to the end of time. Then, the events of the game occur, of course playing out differently depending on the choices that we made. The end of time is technically somewhere around 2021. This is when Paul arrives from his first travel through time, and Beth arrives after Amaral sent her to the wrong date. They both escape with their lives. The other mystery that we haven't really talked about is shifters. These otherworldly beings that Paul was trying to stave off with the lifeboat protocol are actually people with the same powers that Hatch, Jack, and Paul have. People that have been affected by Cronon syndrome eventually become shifters. Shifters are unique because there are many alternate versions of them, and just because one dies doesn't mean the shifter is dead, just that another version will come about. This is why Martin Hatch is alive at the end of Quantum Break, because he was a shifter the entire time. This really isn't made very clear unless we read all of the documents in the game. He leaves Jack a note in Act 5 that mostly explains this. It's one of the most interesting parts of the game, and it's implied that Paul becomes a shifter at the end, that Henry Kim was a shifter, and that Jack could become one someday. The whole world of Quantum Break is incredibly interesting, and Remedy always excels at this sort of world building. I do think in Quantum Break it's a little more in the background, though. There are a ton of documents in the game with very vital information that can just be easily skipped. There's actually a ton of people I found online that just thought Remedy somehow screwed up by having Hatch still alive at the end of the game, but I think the world overall is very interesting. It's also somewhat connected to the Remedy Connected Universe. The game references Alan Wake multiple times, the Night Spring TV show, 
there's a blackboard in the school with tons of scrawled notes about Alan Wake that really looks like the notes I made when I was making my video on the game, and we can find an Alex Casey novel. Also, with the existence of shifters, there's plenty of room for alternate realities to be had here. I should also point out there is a novelization of Quantum Break called Quantum Break Zero State that was written by Cam Rogers who worked on the game as well. It's not just a novelization though, it's an alternate reality version of the events that happened in the game. The book isn't really canon technically, but also Sam Lake states at the beginning of the book that it's basically just an alternate timeline where different events took place. It's actually not a bad book and is a pretty good way of approaching novelization. Quantum Break is an incredibly interesting project. I actually consider it Remedy's most ambitious, but it's still incredibly flawed. There are a lot of integral problems with the game that aren't easily fixed. The combat can be awkward and clunky, like fiddling with a block of wood rather than a controller or keyboard. It can be quite frustrating as well because I think a lot of the ideas are there. The concept of time traveling powers, being able to freeze people in place or run circles around them is great, but it just doesn't really work fully. I think the narrative is really unique, especially in concept. The idea of incorporating a TV show, sort of, into your game is wild. This isn't a very common thing in games, clearly, but Remedy always tries to blur the line between video game, movie, book, and music. It's all nebulous when it comes to them, and this is a hallmark of all their games. I will say that while it is interesting, the execution isn't the best. Some of the TV show can feel really cheap, overdone, and bland. I don't feel like this game had a really interesting aesthetic either, like Alan Wake or Control did. It felt like the world kind of took a back seat. The really interesting parts of the world are left to be found by the player through thousands of words of documents. Now, this is fine, and many games do this, but in Quantum Break, it's put a little too far into the background. The game's story is well done though, and you're constantly questioning where it's going to end up, or really even what's going on. I think the choice-based mechanics should also be given a spotlight here. The fact that we can get wildly different outcomes in the TV show based on the choices we make is a really special idea. There are things that are actually affected here, and this feels like our choice actually matters. Charlie's death in my playthrough, for example, is entirely up to the choices that we make in the game. Also, the ambition involved with forcing us to make choices through the villain of the story should be commended. It makes us run in circles, deciding who we want to support and what we want to happen in the story. We almost feel like we're crafting the narrative with Remedy rather than playing along with what they've determined. The whole project is just interesting, and I think that if you're a fan of what Remedy does, then you will find things here to love. But if you're on the other side of that coin, I don't really think this game is for you. Quantum Break was generally well received, but a lot of critics were divided on parts of the game. Some praised its ambitious story, while others thought it was too complicated. Some loved the gameplay and movement that was available, while others thought it was clunky and loose. Quantum Break also seems to have sold well, with pre-orders exceeding Microsoft's expectations. The game went on to be their best-selling original property since the release of the Xbox One. A sequel to the game was in talks with Microsoft wanting the game to be a flagship title moving forward. In 2016 though, Aaron Greenberg, general manager of marketing at Xbox, said the game sold very well, but like every movie, not every game needs a sequel, and sometimes that's okay. Remedy CEO Taro Vertala said that they wanted to do a sequel, but it was pending approval from Microsoft, who ultimately owns the property. That was the last time we heard any news surrounding a potential sequel to the game. But that wouldn't mean the end to Remedy's connected universe. They would go on to release another game in 2019 that was one of their best yet. But we'll talk about that next time. Bye, Dad.